As all of you know, on uh, February 24th, after over eight years of fighting in eastern Ukraine, uh, Russia began an all-out invasion uh, on its neighboring country, Ukraine, and bringing massive territorial warfare back to the center of Europe. Normal life has been put on hold, the uh, city was destroyed, and millions of uh, people have had to flee their homes or take up arms. Moreover, the war has led to major political shifts uh, in international relations and geopolitics with unprecedented sanctions towards Russia, um, with my home country, Germany, leaving behind decades of uh, pacifist consensus in exchange for a more proactive approach to security policy, and most recently, Sweden and Finland's application to NATO membership. The Ukrainian government has played a remarkable role on the world stage with President Zelensky speaking to national parliaments in countries around the world, successful lobbying for weapons delivery and EU membership and more. So today we want to discuss with uh, leading Ukrainian think tankers what the war means for them and their organizations and how do they work under these circumstances. The role they play in the domestic and international political response to the war and in documenting war crimes. And what kind of support do they actually need from the international thinking community? My name is Claire Lucia Leifert. I'm heading the Think Tank Lab, an initiative uh, founded last year by the German Council on Foreign Relations and Mercator Institute for China Studies with kind support of uh, Stiftung Mercator and Robert Bosch Stiftung. We are based in Berlin uh, in Germany and our mission is to support the co-creative advancement of the Think Tank landscape in Germany and beyond. And um, this was originally planned um, as an event to be co-moderated with Ludmila Melnik, who many of you know. Um, and Mila is a research fellow at the Institute for Europäische Politik and also an alumna of our Thinking Lab Thinking School. Um, and she will be luckily replaced by her colleague Laura Christoph, uh, project manager and research associate with the German-Ukrainian researchers uh, network. Um, and I see that uh, there is some interference uh, with the um, um, unmuted speakers. Maybe, uh, Mr. Yakimenko, can you uh, mute yourself? I think there is. Ah, okay. Now no, I will. it's all. So, um, so how do you know about this event today? Um, so, uh, first of all, let us please know in the chat who you are and what's your connection to the topic of the session, what's your interest in it. Um, some of you have already sent us questions uh, to our speakers with your registration for today's event, and we will take up some of them during the discussion. Um, and of course, you can write all the questions you have in the chat. Uh, we will take them up later, or uh, after the um, discussion among the speakers in the panel, we will also um, open the floor to all of you, and uh, you can click on this blue button on top of the video uh, window um, to request participation um, and to ask your, your question or comment uh, personally as well. Um, so uh, without uh, further ado, I'm handing over to uh, my co-moderator, Laura. Thank you for the introduction, Claire. Um, we are uh, speaking for my colleague Ludmilla um, and myself. We are also glad to be able to co-host this session as part of our project Ukraine Breakfast Debate Series that some of you might be familiar with. Our institute, the Institute for Europäische Politik, has been working with Ukrainian think tanks since 2016. And of course, we would have liked to see a different topic for today's session, but the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine has created a new reality. So today is the 84th day of Russia's all-out attack on Ukraine, and it, continu and it continues to bring vast destruction to Ukrainian cities and immeasurable suffering to the Ukrainian people. So in spite of all of this, our Ukrainian colleagues um, are keeping up their work. They are engaged in volunteer and monitoring work, documenting war crimes, providing analytical support and policy recommendations to state institutions. And uh, many of our colleagues are also now constantly participating in international panels and discussions, giving interviews to international media to provide information from on the ground and also to counter disinformation about Ukraine. 
And what many of uh, what many people will, uh, here now might uh, not know in this context is that when when it comes to um, the funding structure, and I mean even before the war, many independent Ukrainian think tanks have been largely dependent on international donors to realize their projects. So after the all-out invasion began, many of them have lost a big share, some up to 90% of their funding. So with all of that in mind, um, the aim of this session is to give an insight into how the daily work of think tankers in Ukraine has changed since the 24th of February and to answer the questions of what we as the international community can do to support our Ukrainian colleagues. And in order to do so, we invited three very established Ukrainian think tankers who work in quite different areas. So in that way, in the next hour, we are hoping to give you some insight into the key challenges and needs that they are having right now. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our three speakers for the session. And our first speaker is Yuri Yakimenko, and he is the president of the Razumkov Center, which was already founded in 1994, and today is one of the leading Ukrainian think tanks with a focus on foreign and domestic policy. The Razumkov Center is also one of the few organizations that has actually analyzed the specifics of the Ukrainian think tank landscape. And Mr. Yakimenko is also the editor-in-chief of the National Security and Defense Journal. Um, our second speaker for today is Alexandra Matvichuk. She is an award-winning human rights activist, lawyer and head of the Center for Civil Liberties, an organization that has been promoting human rights, democracy and solidarity since it was established in 2007. In 2016, she was awarded the OSCE's Democracy Defender Award for her outstanding commitment to human rights protection. And in June last year, she was nominated to the UN Committee Against Torture and became Ukraine's first female candidate to the UN treaty body, trying to limit violence against women in conflict. And that is not even the first or only time she made uh, history. She also met, ran multiple international mobilization campaigns for the release of illegally imprisoned people from the occupied Crimea and Donbass, and now provides monitoring of war crimes and human rights violations. And last but not least, our third panelist is Ivan Levitsky, and he is the director of the CEDOS NGO Center for Society Research, a think tank that concentrates on social development in Ukraine and the promotion of social justice. And his main research areas are urban development, local governance, and civil society. He was a national expert of the Council of Europe project in Ukraine, and he is also engaged as a trainer on grassroots democracy at the Green Academy, which is organized by the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Ukraine. I welcome all of you to our um, panel today, and I'm truly grateful that you took the time to speak with us today. So, my first question I would like to ask to Mr. Yuri Akimenko, and uh, I want to ask you, um, with your 20 years of experience uh, with working for um, think tanks in Ukraine, you have observed the rise and development of Ukrainian think tanks and also their role for Ukrainian society. So my question to you would be, what does the war mean for Ukrainian think tanks in general, and how do you and your staff practically work under these circumstances now? You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for invitation to this conference. It's very important and very, this panel especially is very timely for us, for Ukrainians. Uh, you completely rightly said that uh, this war is a, a tragedy and suffering for Ukraine, for Ukrainian people. But we strongly believe that we will win and uh, the aggression country, Russia, will uh, bear the full responsibility for those crimes. Uh, of course, uh, this war has broken the normal way of life of everyday citizens, of country as a whole. Of course, it has broken also the normal functioning uh, and work of uh, think tanks. Uh, I can say from our own experience, from the Razum Cool Center experience, uh, probably it uh, corresponds with the general atmosphere because we have uh, a large staff, we have 35 persons more of permanent staff. And uh, you can imagine that uh, in the first days of war, we face the problem that all of our colleagues are completely in different places. 
some has become already in European countries, in Western Europe, in Central Europe. Uh, some of them in uh, Western Ukraine or other more safe regions in Ukraine. Some of them in Kyiv. Uh, and parts of them in uh, territorial defense forces also. So we have complete pictures and we have uh, different people in different places uh, without any connections with each other. So the first challenge was, of course, organizational. We started with uh, establishing uh, contacts and founding the places where we can uh, in, get some information about our colleagues. And we spent almost a week for those. Uh, but then we established a, a common uh, room for communication, a chat in, in Viber, where all appeared, including those who serve us in territorial defense, in uh, armed forces. And we know at least where our people who were armed. And then we started to proceed with uh, working uh, uh, with the renovation of our work in new conditions. Of course, uh, we lost our possibilities to work with uh, in office to use database and so on and so forth. And uh, even to have a direct communication, immediate communication with uh, many people all together. It's very important for research. Uh, but instead, we establish a practice of. Uh, reorienting of our activity because uh, uh, another challenge was that we can't conduct project-based activity. Uh, we started to uh, adopt new realities and as uh, it was a great demand from the media side, Ukrainian and especially international media, uh, most of our experts uh, start to comment on issues uh, linked with war, with related issues uh, for media. Uh, then. Uh, who has such a possibility started to work in their places, contacting with uh, representatives of diplomatic corpus of international community and so on and so forth. Uh, so we were trying to uh, produce uh, our analytical assessment and to broach them to uh, the target audiences. And step by step, we established the system of work in new conditions. And uh, now, despite we are still in different places, we can't work in office, we work on such directions as uh, analysis, information, uh, and spreading those information, uh, working in uh, governmental advice uh, bodies like public councils, uh, Crimean platform uh, security track, and, and, and others I can't mention for the sake of time. Uh, so we step by step solve this problem, uh, how to and arrange uh, everyday based activity when we have our working meeting, meetings in Zoom now, and almost uh, all uh, members of our expert, uh, experts, all our experts participate in them. Uh, but uh, there is another challenge, and this is a very serious challenge for us and for other things. Because, uh, again, because of war, we lost uh, serious sources of our funding. Uh, part of Ukrainian business that were our supporters, then because of war was destroyed, and their uh, capacities to support NGOs like us, they have been lost. And our internal resources, uh, they existed, but uh, step by step, they were exhausted and not uh, without any possibilities to run away. Some of them we spent uh, during COVID pandemic, and then after COVID, the war started. That's the second problem. Uh, but also we tried, uh, we are trying, still trying to fix this problem. Uh, by communication with our international partners, with our donors, and asking them to reformat, to reshape, if it's possible, their support for our activity from project-based to institutional. And we partly succeed in that, and we found the understanding, and we are very grateful for those partners who supported us in this, especially hard first three months of, of, of war that are still going. Uh, but uh, we uh, maintain our human resources during this period. We still uh, pay in salaries. We still know that people have uh, means for their uh, life, food for their uh, needs, uh, and continue to work in this, this direction. And uh, now with the time passing and with the uh, success of Ukrainian armed forces and Ukraine, in uh, winning this war, we step by step approaching to the renovation of our project based activity. We're thinking about new uh, topics because uh, those that have been planned lost 
part was the most uh, actuality instead the new appear now we are thinking about our projects we are uh, communicating with potential donors uh, and uh, preparing to uh, to restart our work in the Kiev office uh, uh, at least for those people who are ready who are in Kiev already and who, who, who can reach uh, and start start working there so war brought challenges but uh, we are working on that and we are trying to find a solution and still continue our activity in these conditions and I hope that all of my colleagues all of Ukraine and same cancer will succeed in that thank you Thank you, Mr. Yakimenko, for this um, for this insight. Um, my next que question will go to uh, Ms. Matvichuk. And um, you are an expert when it comes to advocating and prosecuting human human rights violations. And in some of the recent public statements you made, um, you appeal to international organizations to increase their presence on the ground in Ukraine. Um, and I want to ask you, um, what role does your organization play in the domestic and international political response to the war and in documenting war crimes? And how do you cooperate with Ukrainian but also international organizations in achieving accountability for the crimes against humanity and also international law that have been committed by the Russian army? Thank you very much for providing me the floor. Uh, I will start with that point that since the new wave of large-scale Russian invasion started, we have resumed the work of our Euromaidan SOS initiative and brought up several hundreds of volunteers to document war crime. Uh, together with other human rights organizations in Ukraine, we work in the Tribunal for Putin Global Initiatives. Based on our documentation work, we can state that Russia is simply using war crimes as the methods of warfare, and such actions are not justified by any military necessity. Russia is providing deliberate attacks on civilian objects like schools, hospitals, residential buildings, and critical civilian infrastructure. We also documented using of human shields, rape and other gender-based violence, deliberate killings, tortures and ill-treatment, enforced disappearances among civilians in occupied territories. So when we speak about the Russian invasion in Ukraine, we speak about a huge number of crimes. And now for us, as for human rights defenders, is the main question in this regard, how we can effectively deliver justice for all victims of international crimes in this war. Uh, and when we speak about different ways, uh, the first uh, idea appears that in International Criminal Court will step in to this goal. Uh, the International Criminal Court announced on 2nd of March uh, this year that uh, court had proceeded to open an investigation into the situation in Ukraine on the basis of two declarations which we, uh, our government sent in the beginning of the war in 2014-2015. But it's important to mention that according to ICC procedure, the court will focus only on the top officials, political and top military leaders, and will select it only several cases to investigate. This is in turn mean that bringing thousands of perpetrators of these crimes to justice remains Ukrainian responsibility. And our law enforcement and judicial system is totally unprepared for such challenge. Because once again, we are in war and it's very difficult uh, to cope with such a huge amount of crime, even for a well-developed state bodies we in Ukraine have never had a luxury to live with a well-developed state, bodies like uh, judiciary system or law enforcement. So it's urgent ta a task for, for think tanks and for human rights defenders uh, to, th to invent uh, how we can strengthen the capacity of the Ukrainian national system to fulfill the duty to fight with an impunity in this war. And for current moment, we have only temporal practical support. For example, France sends their policemen to work in the Kiev region, but they will return to France sooner or later. And we have to find a way of constant involvement of the international element to the level of investigation and delivery justice at the domestic level. 
and possibly in form of international hybrid tribunal. So I use this opportunity to address uh, to our audience uh, who uh, gathered people from different countries, from different uh, think tanks, to, to think together with Ukrainian colleagues how to do it. Thank you. Thank you, um, Smartichuk. Uh, I'm sure we will uh, get back to some of the um, points that you made um, later in the discussion. Um, but for now, um, turning to our third speaker, Mr. Vavitsky, and um, I want to ask you um, about uh, reconstruction. Um, because right now, or as of now, it is estimated that Ukraine will need more than 600 billion euro for reconstruction. And you being an expert in the field of urban development, um, are there already concrete initiatives that could contribute to the reconstruction of Ukrainian cities? And um, what is the role of your organization in this? And perhaps you could also speak to how your work and the work of your colleagues at uh, CEDAS changed compared um, to before the 24th of February. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. I would say that, uh, of course, we have already a lot of initiatives and platforms um, trying to work on, uh, on some plans or ideas how to rebuild uh, the country or damaged cities or buildings. But also we have like a big humanitarian crisis uh, uh, today and with big uh, numbers of refugees for example which were uh, uh, fleeing their cities uh, and towns and villages uh, in like central eastern northern or southern ukraine to the western part of the country uh, there is a big like housing crisis for example in the western part of ukraine when people live in schools or some sport or culture facilities and uh, it's a big uh, challenge for the country for the government uh, to accommodate a lot of people it, we know that it is also a challenge for our neighboring countries who um, welcome refugees but also it's a big challenge for ukraine itself and also it's a challenge because some people even not leave their towns or cities, but their houses are damaged or destroyed. And now we have summer uh, almost, but uh, we will have winter in the half of the year and people need uh, to have some shelter uh, like, um, yeah. So uh, it's not only about rebuilding as uh, some process after the war when we will need to resume some like normal life economy and so on but it also a big issue now how to live through because uh, also we can't understand as of today uh, how much how long it will be yeah and we uh, see rocket attacks like on the western part of the country, for example. And in uh, this situation, we can be sure that any infrastructure that will be rebuilt today won't be damaged or destroyed a week later. Uh, so it's a big challenge for everybody. Uh, we, uh, as I said, we have uh, some different um, like civic uh, initiatives uh, to work on this issue, some groups of people who I think so thinking about um, the future, actually, yeah, and uh, trying to uh, make this vision of the future. But also we have a so-called National Council on Reconstruction and Rebuilding, uh, which consists uh, of a lot of working groups uh, led by Ukrainian ministries, uh, which are trying to establish some plan of recovery. But uh, with this situation, of course, we have uh, a lot of civil society organizations and think tanks uh, trying to help the government, but uh, as it is in many other uh, spheres of life, uh, our government has some administrative um, challenges. Yeah, and uh, sometimes uh, not everything uh, doing well because we actually have a war. 
Uh, so not all the processes may be as good as we expect or want. So it's a big challenge for all of us. Um, uh, I would say that uh, we as an organization are trying to work uh, as we can uh, as a think tank, yeah, to do some research, to do some analysis, to do some media appearances and so on. Uh, so it, from this point of view, it looks like normal life because we do uh, what we uh, do in like normal situation, some research, some analysis, uh, some speaking, but on the other hand, uh, the content of uh, what we are analyzing is so different. And of course, we all have this um, security uh, issues. Uh, fortunately, all our team members are safe and alive now, but uh, every day uh, we have uh, security risks uh, for all of us. So, uh, and, and we can't basically plan anything uh, to more than today, tomorrow, or next week. Uh, so, yeah, something like that. Maybe I will continue later. Um, uh, as you said, you are also um, engaged with um, issues of migration and education. And um, according to a recent um, UNICEF report, um, I read that more than half of Ukrainian children uh, have been forced to leave their home um, during the war. And a lot of them are, of course, displaced in other countries than Ukraine. And I was wondering, um, how do you basically navigate between the short-term goal of them, of those children being integrated into um, the local education systems in other countries so that they can, of course, continue school and their education. And on the other side, the more midterm, long-term goal to reintegrate them into the Ukrainian schooling system, or at least for now, keep them in sync with it. Actually, we have some uh, problems of administrative capacity of our Ministry of Education. Uh, uh, but uh, yes, it is a big problem because we actually have uh, Ukraine online schooling which is going on and uh, we know cases of children who are uh, at the same time are attending schools in some European countries but at the same time attending Ukrainian schools online because uh, it's like mandatory to, to have Ukrainian education certificates for example uh, because they basically do not know how much it will be, uh, how long it will be and uh, what to do in like long-term perspective so uh, it is one issue. Of course, we will have this issue in September when new educational year will be started. And it's also will be problem like for Ukrainian schools because in many of them, basically some internally displaced people are living in like classrooms. So uh, we basically do not have infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in this kind of way. Uh, many of schools are destroyed uh, by like bombing uh, because, you know, uh, why not to destroy some schools uh, in Ukraine? Um, uh, maybe they call it denazification. Uh, on the other hand, we have big problems with uh, schools on uh, occupied territories because uh, it's a big... Um, pressure on uh, on basically children's and uh, their families but also on teachers to it, it is like one of the first things that uh, uh, occupant forces are doing they are trying to restart the schools on russian educational programs uh, because of course it is a sign that uh, they basically want to re-educate people as, uh, in like way they want. So it's also a big challenge, uh, not only for us, but I think for all international community to have some pressure um, and to like save uh, Ukrainian kids, basically teachers, in these occupied uh, areas from like life threats but also uh, to preserve the right to have education in their own language, for example. Thank you. Uh, I have um, another question to um, 
Mr. Yakimenko, actually. Um, and I would like to ask you um, how the relationship between the state and civil society in Ukraine has changed after the 24th of February, and also um, how critical independent think tanks can be of their own government in the situation. Uh, uh, you know, what we observe after the beginning of war, uh, it's uh, uh, like in a similar uh, situation, the challenges for the country, it's a huge growth of activity of civil society, of civil society organization in different levels, on national level, local level, of volunteers, of obvious people, uh, it's from the other side. But uh, from, the, from one side, but from the other side, we also see that uh, the governmental institutions uh, has become, uh, in my opinion, uh, more closed because of conditions of war. Uh, probably more uh, on one side, of course, they are open for cooperation in social humanitarian uh, issues, but on the other hand, in uh, more sensitive politically related, uh, military security related issues, uh, we see uh, I think that there is no such kind of breakthrough and uh, movement uh, towards uh, each other. So civil society is doing its job and the government is doing its own job. Uh, it's, it's my my point. Probably my colleague may, may disappear with me. Uh, uh, on general, uh, of course, atmosphere is uh, not very apt for criticizing the government. Because we are seeing now that the government is doing all its best as he can do best. Uh, to the extent that there are capacities and objective conditions and subjective capacities, capacities to, to do that. In, uh, again, in uh, all, almost all spheres, but especially in the sphere of military, of, uh, of war, of uh, everything that links to uh, immediate country into aggression country and to its troops on the territory of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, I think that there is an element of uh, kind of self-censorship in uh, civil society, in kind of, in symptoms as well, probably. That uh, speaking with to each other, we are saying that probably it's not the time to criticize too much or criticize at all. Let's win first and then trying to uh, analyze, to reveal mistakes if they are and so on. So it's very complicated situation uh, also for us because think tanks uh, as they exist in Ukraine, they were more critical to any government. They were no completely good or bad government, but they were more critical. Uh, now it's a rather specific situation. And uh, another point to, final, uh, to finalize with that. But uh, now we are uh, seriously limited in objective information which is happening, and some of uh, these uh, limits are completely proved by situation uh, in military sphere. And also we don't have, because of any reasons, uh, for instance, as uh, Ivan said, that we can't calculate how many schools have been destroyed because we don't know whether together to, today or tomorrow another one. Uh, would say will be destroyed. So we don't have objective information for economic statistics, uh, calculation, analysis, and so on and so forth. And it uh, also make uh, some uh, restrictions, limitations for our work uh, as scientists. Uh, Thank, Thank you, Mr. Yakimenko. Um, um, maybe you also want to comment on that, uh, Ms. Matvichuk, on the um, civil society state relationship, but also I was wondering in the kind of other direction, uh, I was watching an interview with you um, recently and you said that the Russian army is not only fighting against um, um, the Ukrainian army, but against the Ukrainian society as a whole. And uh, I was wondering how maybe also the relationship between your organization and let's say ordinary uh, citizens has changed. Um, 
Yes, I think that Putin uh, fooled the victims of his own Russian propaganda. He expected that he faced uh, with Ukraine only with uh, our armed forces, and he was uh, uh, not prepared to face with the struggle of the whole Ukrainian nation. I don't know the uh, current sociology, but now there is no indifferent people in Ukraine. The majority involved into the general struggle in different ways. And this is something which has also not been under, uh, understood by West before this large-scale invasion. Uh, when I talked with uh, Western colleagues before 24 February, they asked me why your president are so calm uh, and uh, um, don't uh, tell about uh, serious uh, of this threat. And I always answer that you in West developed democracies uh, got used to live uh, with a well-developed uh, state uh, um, bodies. We in Ukraine have never had such luxury to live with a well-developed state bodies. That's why when something happened, the point of crystallization will appear in not only in office of president, but in a lot of fields of civil uh, in society in general. And now the civil society is rapidly boost because um, like uh, a huge amount of people join to the work. Uh, they, uh, they, they different volunteers initiative emerge in different fields who provide assistance with evacuation, with medical care, with logistical supplies, with documentation of war crimes and with everything which is needed for current moment. And that's why when we speak about civil society in Ukraine, uh, we have to understand that it's not a right approach to connect only with a organization which worked before this uh, uh, large scale invasion. The landscape of civil society is rapidly changed now. We have a lot of active people who wasn't active uh, before, and now they create a very effective uh, civil society institutions. And uh, I will add um, a, a little bit about um, previous uh, question in relation with the Ukrainian authorities. Um, we, uh, now you see a huge support uh, of action of president. We have a, a, a sociology, and this uh, sociology shows the general unity of Ukrainian people under the existential threats, because Russia was to kill us and to liquidate Ukrainian state uh, at an at a, at a, um, actor on a geopolitical arena. Uh, Kremlin officially told that Ukraine has not right to exist, there is no Ukrainian language, no Ukrainian culture, so it's, uh, this war has several dimensions. First, it's a war for independence, uh, and I hope that finally we cut all ties with the old Soviet Union, uh, which uh, um, Putin want us to return. And second, this, this, uh, the second dimension, this is a word for our democratic choice, because now we are paying a, a rather high price only for a right to have a chance to build a country where judiciary is independent, government is accountable, rights of everybody is protected, and police uh, don't beat a peaceful student, student demonstration as we saw during Maidan times. So for us, victory, in this war is not only repeal Putin from Ukraine. For us, this war have also values dimension. We have to continue and to successfully manage our democratic transformations, and uh, which will have a huge impact to the whole region, uh, Eurasia region, and to the Russia itself. And uh, this is important to take in mind because when people are in war, it's a huge challenge to the value of human rights, of freedom, and, and for rule of law and a lot of other values. And we have always to remember that we are fighting not only for territory, we are fighting for our democratic choice. And there is no sense for us to, to win this war with Russia and to transfer to authoritarian model by ourselves. And we see also as a human rights defenders our task to consult Ukrainian authorities in this very uh, dangerous time, uh, not to cross the red lines and to preserve the space for freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, insightful statements and also um, all the answers to my questions. Uh, I would have uh, 
some more, but right now I will um, give the moderation back to my colleague Claire and she will open the discussion um, to the audience and take up questions from the chat. Yes, thank you so much um, also from my side for giving insights both in your day-to-day -day work but also into the larger international political implications of, of what you do um, at the moment. Um, I have a question um, uh, for myself first to start off and then I will go to the audience and please um, everyone you can um, uh, post your questions in the chats and comments. Um, I uh, know uh, OTD conferences from the past years has been very lively places for debate so don't shy away uh, for asking um, or commenting on what has been said and also of course you can request uh, the floor uh, to join us here on video. So uh, the first question for me would be um, how do you work like very practically with policymakers in Ukraine um, at the moment? Like are you in touch with them and what do they need from you at the moment? I can only imagine that they have so much on their minds right now that I'm curious to learn how the policy advice works in practice at the moment. Um, maybe, um, Alexandra, you want to answer because you just said that um, you also advise government not to cross the red line. So how in practice is this working? Do you have meetings? Do you have uh, chats? Uh, how do you work with them? Uh, first of all, I would like to um, once again mention that we are in war and it's not like uh, uh, ordinary uh, work of human rights who can meet in with uh, representatives of parliament or meet in representatives with government. It's very hard to understand how we are working. I can only suggest to come and to see on their own eyes, but I will try to, um, uh, to provide several examples. Uh, I, I, will, uh, I will tell it because maybe uh, uh, very structural and uh, systematic work because every day we fighting with hundreds of fires which emerged sure. and it's and right into requests to the thousands of requests of helps of people so but parallel we uh, we um, have uh, um, established a very intensive cooperation with different state uh, stakeholders on different topics and here also a huge difference between ukraine and russia if you take the Hofstede uh, research, you will see that distance between authorities uh, and uh, people in Russia is very high. In Ukraine, it's become very short. Now we are cooperating not for, through the official letters, but with the minister and uh, top officials through signal chats. Because uh, we have to solve problem very quickly and uh, to find a solution very quickly. And uh, yes, of course, uh, unfortunately, not all our recommendations were taken into account, but into practical point of view, when we all, we all together tried to find a way how to help one million people who were legally transferred to Russia, or what uh, we can do in order to stop level of brutality of violation of uh, uh, Ukrainian prisoners, in uh, which, uh, uh, I mean, civilians uh, who was uh, legally taken from Kiev region, for example, and now in Kursk and Bryansk detention center. We are able to, to work on an equal um, stage and very quickly to manage a hypothesis. Why I say about hypothesis? Because we are working in condition where the whole international system of rule of law, of peace and security lays in ruins, like in Mariupol, and you couldn't rely upon on conventions or international treaties or international organization. Russia don't care about their decisions and mm -hmm. or about the norms of international humanitarian law. That's why uh, we couldn't have this uh, special um, characteristic which has a law, a law predictability. That's why we have hypothesis. Maybe this will work in this situation and jointly fulfill it. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, we can take up uh, right here also this question posted in the chat by Enrique um, about, again, this um, relationship between government, civil society and public relations that, of course, is very different, as you described, in uh, war times. So um, do you see this also as a chance to build back better, so to say, to also address institutional weaknesses that have been maybe there before the war and now, like, after the war, you, uh, uh, you can have, like, even... 
a more open debate, more plurality, more open access to information, etc. Do you see this crisis as a chance for um, a more reform in the future? Uh, let me say that it's not a crisis. It's uh, our adopting to new realities. As Alexandra said, it's completely different situations than we see it in uh, our offices and can uh, walk to the Kovnarada or to government and to meet deputies and uh, to comment something, to propose and so on and so forth. So it's a different situation uh, on the level of the meanings even, not even means of communication themselves. Uh, so uh, I think that it's not uh, really, it's not a crisis, it's a transition to different different forms and uh, different uh, different priorities in this communication. Now we are proposing what we will think is better for our country to succeed in this war, to get rid of these invaders from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't think too much about the growth of capacities mm -hmm. of uh, our governance structures for this moment. It's not a priority yeah. for now, this moment. I think that uh, after our victory, we will turn back to uh, the problem, uh, the other problems of uh, transparency, openness, and accountability, and so on and so forth. But now we have uh, slightly other priorities. It doesn't mean that we just close eyes if uh, government will be doing something wrong. But now we concentrate on our activities in order to make the activity more productive precisely in, in this direction. Uh, moreover, uh, with, uh, if we take a prospect to Ukraine to uh, get the status of country candidate for accession to the EU, then we will start a new process. In the process of rebuilding, after war rebuilding, we start uh, also the process of modernization uh, in order to be completely compat uh, compatible with the uh, countries uh, and members of the EU. So each a chance for restoration of all our models in economy and governance and so on and so forth, in order to be uh, closer to the standards and closer to uh, start the practical uh, procedure of of accession and conversations. So, mm -hmm. uh, but this is a uh, this task is for uh, I hope near future. But now we are in a situation when uh, we uh, have to select uh, strictly our priorities and to uh, work in order to to win, win this war. Sure, yeah. So maybe uh, let me jump on this directly. Um, so you, um, uh, Alexander Matvichuk, um, mentioned before the, the great uh, unity among Ukrainians at the moment. And you, uh, Mr. Kimenko, um, uh, mentioned, um, the, for example, the EU accession uh, campaign uh, to have like a, a accelerated accession process. So do you, among the think tanks in Ukraine, do you coordinate your efforts at the moment? Because from the outside, I can say that the political communication coming from Ukraine, be it from government or civil society, seems very coordinated. It seems very unified. So do you coordinate among the think tanks um, in Ukraine? Uh, For me, the connection is very bad. Is it the same for others or only for me? I can't I can't understand you, uh, Mr. Kimenko. It's uh, very uh, robotic. No, <laughs> Okay, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if it's on my side or in yours, but I think others also can't hear you. Um, maybe turn off the video uh, and uh, could you repeat again what you said about the cooperation? Uh, no, it's not better at all. Maybe, lo uh, maybe you can refresh your browser. Um, sometimes it helps leave and rejoin it is the audio we heard you perfectly fine before that so i'm sure we can find a solution and maybe we can uh, use the time to to go to um ivan verbitsky um so uh, you mentioned before and it's very good to hear that um you said 
um, all of your uh, colleagues are still there. You were able to continue uh, paying the um, salaries, um, even though everyone is dispersed within Ukraine and abroad. Do you observe brain drain in your organizations? And the question I'm asking is because um, uh, we saw in the early days of the invasion, like many uh, fellowships being offered by international think tanks to Ukrainian researchers. But then also we heard from Ukrainian colleagues saying, okay, well, actually that doesn't help us very much because we would like to be able to continue paying um, our colleagues uh, salaries and not losing them uh, for the long term. So how do you observe this um, Yeah, this form of solidarity in a way, and, and, and do you observe brain drain in your organization? I'm not sure that I can say that I'm observing brain drain right now. Uh, it's more like a threat or risk. But of course, uh, I would like to join uh, the call uh, like of my colleagues to, first of all, Uh, help or assist Ukrainian institutions because Ukrainian civil society institutions and like state institutions, to be honest, because we also have some, uh, you know, academia or cultural institutions which are state funded or state affiliated. And uh, sometimes they have some like administrative problems, but they are doing a great job uh, considering like the situation. Uh, at the moment also. So um, we need uh, to preserve these institutions because these institutions is uh, like the skeleton um, that enables uh, the development of Ukraine. So it's crucial to have, uh, like to, to, to exist basically. And uh, I like uh, can uh, agree with Yuri that a lot of NGOs and think tanks faced some challenges regarding finances, for example, because, of course, uh, either uh, some, uh, like, um, uh, some profit, like, from our activities, for example, when we uh, do some research uh, for some organizations, for example, or grants or crowdfunding, uh, all these sources uh, are not working uh, so good as before today. So for, on the other hand, many organizations face uh, some like new challenges. For example, uh, their staff are not in Ukraine anymore, for example, or they are doing some volunteer um, activities. They basically help people with like humanitarian uh, problems. So um, it's like... Uh, new, not easy situation for them as an organization that have some goals and uh, mission and so on. So it is a challenge. And uh, like from this point of view, I can basically one more time say that it's very important to have this institutional support of Ukrainian organizations. But also speaking about the way how to help Ukrainian think tanks or Ukrainian civil society, I would say that the first and the most important thing is to like uh, to help us preserve Ukraine as a state, to help us to win this war. And uh, your efforts in your own countries, uh, in advocacy for assistant to assistance to Ukraine, first of all, military assistance, humanitarian assistance, and sanctions of Russia, is the first and uh, like uh, the most important issue. Because uh, without uh, like without this, any other support uh, will have no 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 um, no sense. I would also um, jump to the another question discussed before about uh, about the rebuilding and do do we can uh, like rebuild uh, Ukraine better? Yeah, and basically. It is what our president uh, is repeating day after day, that we need to rebuild Ukraine better than it was before, because, of course, we have some problems in different areas. And we all want to do this. But like in reality, we also understand that uh, it is a big risk, because, of course, war is like a big risk for like democracy and uh, society and so on. So, like, uh, we dream and we want to do it better, but, like, um, um, with our analysis, 
and uh, understanding uh, that maybe uh, like we will have big issues and we already have big issues and we will have it more and more. Um, it might be not so easy, uh, but uh, what I also uh, hear uh, more and more, it is the idea that uh, our state is somehow... Um, have uh, this like top-down approach because of course of the Soviet heritage but now we see this big um, emerging civil society which is based on some uh, other approach like horizontal approach uh, and uh, I hear the voices which is advocating for rebuilding the state by this new logic of networks and horizontal ties Mm -hmm. which is of course more democratic and I hope that uh, this idea uh, of in like institutional rebuilding will be helpful for preserving democracy and uh, for like um, uh, helping our state to function better. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we have uh, Yuria Kimenko back with us again. We can see you again. Let's try uh, our luck if we can hear you as well um, uh, to talk about um, coordination among think tanks in Ukraine. And I will also combine it with another question that came um, uh, before from the audience. So would Ukrainian think tanks also like to see more collaboration with the international think tank community? And if so, what might that look like? So maybe you can combine coordination within Ukraine among think tanks um, for political advocacy and also um, with international uh, think tanks. It's still very bad for me, unfortunately. I can't understand you. I don't know what happened. We heard you perfectly well earlier. Is it the yeah. same for the others? Okay. Yeah, they can't hear you. We can't hear you. Uh, hello. I'm <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Um, Yuri, uh, maybe if you have phones, uh, you can maybe try to plug in. Or maybe if you have, I don't know if it's the internet, if you have some cable, maybe sometimes you did try to join already. So I don't know. That that Those are my suggestions to try to, to fix it. Otherwise, I think we are at almost at the end of our session. So um, I hope that it will be possible in another um, a forum to um, to continue this um, this discussion. Um, I think it was uh, very uh, very helpful, and I would like to do like a final round with all of you to just ask you again, like if there is one thing that uh, you would like to ask the participants of this session to take away. How, um, what kind of support would you like to see from the international thinking community? Uh, maybe you can, um, yeah, maybe uh, Ivan, maybe you would like to start. I just can repeat that first and most important that you can do uh, is to uh, pressure to your own government to arm Ukraine now and to sanction Russia as soon as possible. Alexandra Matvichuk. I'm a human rights lawyer and 20 years of my life I dedicated to work with uh, uh, strengthening the rule of law. But my recommendation will be the same. We need weapons from Western governments. We need uh, such kind of sanctions which can stop ability of Russian economy to fit this war. Because now we are fighting not only for Ukraine. We are fighting for the rights to have a democratic choice as a such, and results of this fight will have a huge impact to the whole world, because it will encourage uh, other countries to behave uh, the same if the story will have another end. And even more, uh, Kremlin officially told that Ukraine is only intermediate target, so if we will not be able to stop Putin in Ukraine, he will go further. And uh, last but not the least, even now in this uh, um, 
working on this issue, we have to think about future international system of peace and security, because this system is not work anymore. It's very visible when you are in Mariupol that all this general secretary of UN, Council of Europe and other procedures is not appropriate for the 21st century and these uh, events which accompanied this 21st century. And this is a threat not only for Ukraine, but for the whole world. It's very dangerous to live in a world when you couldn't rely upon an international system and you can rely upon on only army and your international allies. Thank you. Yuri Akimenko, we try again. Can you can you hear us? We can't we can't hear you. I don't know. I'm very sorry, but um, I hope that it will be uh, possible later. So the conference will also go on for another day, and we have more sessions coming up this afternoon. So um, thank you very much uh, to our speakers from from my side, uh, from the Think Tank Lab. It was uh, very um, very interesting and insightful, and I think um, that um, yeah, everybody we we had many more participants than we expected now because this is such a timely discussion to to be had and uh, maybe you've already seen uh, Alexandra also um, uh, shared her contact data in the chat. Maybe this was also just the beginning of some new um, collaborations um, and connections here. I would very much hope so, um, at least. Um, if I may say some last words, um, I hope you can hear me. My empathy goes out to Mr. Yakimenko because I've uh, also had problems with my internet connection in the meantime. Um, I also just want to say uh, thank you to our three panelists uh, for taking the time. Thank you to the Think Tank Lab for uh, inviting us to co-host a session with them uh, today, to the team of on Think Tanks uh, for giving us this platform to connect today, and um, also to the German Federal Foreign Office who have been so kindly supporting our project, the German-Ukrainian Researchers Network. So um, thank you and see you at one of our next events. Maybe.